So I'm just going to kick things off. Um, I'm going to stay out of the way most of the time, but um, I want to sort of act as the MC tonight. Um, firstly, to thank Gene Mall for this collaboration. We're very grateful. And the Manchester Community Library uh, as well for this beautiful venue. Um, we're very excited to talk with Frank Holland this evening. And of course, as Gloria said, you'll have an opportunity to hear this wonderful violin in performance on Thursday at the Art Club Pavilion. We have a program of Schumann and Brahms, Rebecca Clark, and Gabriel Fauré. Uh, the instrument will be on display in both Brahms and Fauré, so actually a lot of variety of colors and tone, you know, tone palettes. I might even play it. You might even play it. <laughs> And of course, we're joined by an amazing cast in addition to Frank Holland. Um, I'll be performing with Frank, but we have uh, violist Ara Gregorian, who's here tonight, as well as cellist Beyonce, who's also here tonight, and French hornist Audrey Flores will be joining us for the Bronx Horn Trio. So it's going to be a lot of fun, and it's going to be our final uh, main stage chamber music concert of the season. So now I'm going to turn things over to Frank. Um, Frank is very experienced in talking about this particular violin, which uh, holds a uh, really interesting pedigree. And uh, why don't we get started maybe with a little background and how it sort of landed in Milwaukee. <laughs> right. Um, I, you know, it's still amazing to me. Essentially, uh, in 2008, I got an email one morning, and it was one of these emails that I kind of get a few of these every year, or somebody pulls me aside and said, hey, you know, I've, I, I found this Stradivari at, at this yard sale, <laughs> and I'm, I'm certain it's, it's real, and um, what, what do you think I should do? Because, you know, it's a, it's a Stradivarius from 1982. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I read this email, and it, I was really struck because it was really different. It, it had a lot of knowledge and intellect and depth behind it, and a lot of detail about a golden period Strad meaning from roughly 1710 to say, depending on which dealer you talk to, um, you know, maybe 1720 or so. Stradivari died in 1737, so the 1982 thing didn't really <laughs> add up. Um, and I thought this is really interesting because I did a little digging. I didn't know much about this instrument, but the person writing, I also didn't, I had, this came completely from a stranger. I had no idea who this person was. And uh, they had obviously done their research and knew the name of the instrument, had a lot of history behind it. And it turns out that it was an instrument that had sort of disappeared about, you know, quote unquote, disappeared about 20 years earlier. In other words, it was, a, a very prominent Stradivari violin that no one had played in public for quite a while. That's a long time for a golden period Strad not to be played in public by someone. You know, usually uh, famous artists have them, younger artists are loaned them. Um, so I thought this is really uh, different, you know, and I discreetly got in touch with a friend of mine in Chicago who's a sort of expert in this field. It was a little tricky because, you know, you start talking about stuff like that and dealers sort of come out of the woodwork. <laughs> and, um, you know, we think you should do this with it and do this with it. And uh, there was one guy I really trusted and sent him the email and I'd worked with him for years on various instruments. And I myself was lucky enough to have a number of really high-end Italian instruments, including a couple of Stradivari instruments uh, over many, many decades. And he, he immediately wrote me back and said, you know, this, this actually sounds like it's for real. You know, maybe, maybe you should just write them back and say, is there any way we can see this instrument? And um, just 
figure out whether it's legit. So it turns out that the person that wrote the email was in the city of Milwaukee uh, with the violin, which was being stored in a bank vault and had been there for at least, well, probably about a year and a half. Uh, and it was part of an estate situation. They weren't looking to sell it. They weren't looking to loan it out or anything like that. And uh, they were basically looking for information. So over the next, <laughs> within, within four or five days, we had gotten together because they were in town. So 10 minutes from my house, I met these people um, at a storage locker, literally a storage locker. And it, the violin was not there, uh, but they had, they, it was, since it was part of an estate of someone who had recently passed away in their family, uh, there were papers everywhere and belongings everywhere. They had brought all of uh, this person's stuff back from uh, New York City where, where he had lived. And we started, sort of struck up a friendship and easily hit it off. It was just me and two other people. And I kept asking them questions about things like insurance papers and authenticity papers, which become very important uh, when you're dealing with the musical equivalent of, you know, like some lost Rembrandt or something. Uh, but there was no violin. And um, that got my attention. Um, <laughs> finally, after about half an hour of digging around and, you know, uh, getting you know, more acquainted, I finally said, well, where, where is the violin? And one of the owners said, well, it's, a, it's in a bank vault because when we brought it back, we weren't sure what to do with it. It had been under a bed on West 92nd Street, for, <laughs> literally, for, for about 20 years. Uh, there's a backstory to this, which we'll get to at some point. Uh, and they had brought it back and didn't know what to do with it, so they, they put it in the equivalent of a large safe deposit box with humidity at approximately 20%, which, which is not great for wooden, wooden acoustic instruments. So the first thing we said was, somebody's gotta look at this instrument. First of all, to see if it is what you're talking about, although all the indications were, and also, just to see what shape it's in, you know, they, they need to be played. It's, they're, they're these sort of living things and they need to be played and taken care of. And from the papers I saw, it looked like they had kept up the insurance to a certain extent, you know, and they took it in the, once in a while to get it looked at. But the fact is nobody had, pl had played it. So it was gonna sound a little strange. Anyway, two days after that, we're down in a bank vault. <laughs> and it's me, the owners, my expert friend from Chicago uh, drove up and we just went in the bank vault of uh, the you know, local bank that was literally 10 minutes from my house and uh, this sort of surly bank employee <laughs> took us into a, a safe deposit box room and there was a big table and you know, said, is this, is this the one? And brought out this case and just clunked it down on the, on the, well, it was okay. I mean, the case was strong and so. And uh, we opened it up and I looked at my friend and it's like, that's the Lipinski Strad. He spotted it from across the room. He's like, that's it. I mean, there's no, he knew everything about them. You can't fake them. And um, it did need a little bit of care um, there were some immediate repairs that needed to be done, but it actually was in remarkably good shape, even though it hadn't been played. Um, it, it needed some immediate attention. And to my astonishment, the owners said, okay, um, go ahead, take it back to Chicago and, and fix it up and we'll see you in a couple weeks and then we can talk from there. <laughs> So my friend who owns a dealership and repair thing for super high-end instruments uh, 
sign something. <laughs> At the time, you know, this was a very valuable instrument, not as valuable as it is now, but, you know, it, it was significant. And he put it in his car and drove back to Chicago. <laughs> put it in the vault down there, and about a month later, we all convened down there. And the idea was for us to sort of say, okay, this is what happens if you keep it. Uh, this is what happens if you sell it. This is what happens if you loan it out. This is what happens if you leave it under your bed <laughs> for, for 25 years. So it was really more of an informational exchange, and, um, they, we, we kept in touch. They weren't sure what they were gonna, what they were gonna do with it. It had last been sold in 1962 to this family um, for about $16,000. So for those of you who know financial implications of capital gains and things like that, um, we strongly advised them not to sell it and uh, uh, unlike every dealer that was chasing them at the time, um, just to hang on to them. Because this was 2008, there had just been a crash. Uh, the instruments were sort of like this. But it's strange, uh, there was a lot of, at, at that time as there is now in a way, a lot of cash flying around. And they are portable investments. It's not like real estate. Um, it's not like buying a fancy car that loses its value within an hour. Uh, so it was clear these instruments were going through the roof and we just gave them our, our best advice. And when we went to Chicago, it was in playing condition, so I finally got to just play a few notes for them. And even in the shape that it was in, it, you could tell it had that, that kind of thing, you know? Uh, people ask all the time, like, what, what's the big deal about it, a Stradivari? It's, it's, a, it's a wooden box. <laughs> and I think a lot of people don't understand that Stradivari really was much more than just an instrument maker. He was probably the most important and most gifted instrument maker, I would say, of any instrument uh, in, in history. And there were several reasons for that. One, he had sort of taken, you know, the violin was basically invented in the, in, uh, the, the 16th century by the Amati family. And Stradivari had taken a lot of their ideas and designs and patterns 100 years later. And he was an incredibly gifted designer, engineer. He was a um, ferociously, uh, aggressive businessman and he put a lot of violin makers out of business very quickly because of his gifts and his imagination and he became very very famous pretty early on and he you know people have this vision of Strata very kind of like sitting at a workbench carving stuff like an old guy, you know, just sitting there like this. And the, the, the fact is he probably had at any given time, this was in Cremona, a little town in Italy, um, where for some reason most of the great violins in the 18th century were made. Everybody was, that just happened. Uh, he probably had two or three people working for him most of the time. Uh, he oversaw this whole operation and became incredibly wealthy uh, early on in his life, which allowed him to do a lot of things and expand his business to an extent that nobody could really touch him. There were other great violin makers, but he could get, because he was so wealthy, he could get the best materials, he could get the best people working for him, he could get anything he wanted, the best spaces to work. And pretty soon, everybody wanted a Stradivari. So he made them in batches. You know, you, everybody's sort of keeping up with the Medici's, you know. <laughs> and 
Uh, you know, people would order two or three of them at a time. And if he was lucky, he'd probably put out five, six, seven instruments a year. You know, this is all done by hand. And uh, at the same time, he was this, you know, brilliant intellect who was constantly de redesigning patterns. Um, and by patterns, I mean the actual design of the instruments. Um, up until that time, in the 1600s, 1500s, 1600s, people would play concerts. This, this would have been considered a very large room for a concert. It was essentially something that the aristocracy controlled. And because of that, the instruments were not particularly powerful. They might be really beautiful, especially a lot of the Amati instruments and the Amati family became the sort of dynasty until the plague wiped out all of them except for one, one person. Uh, and Stradivari just sort of inherited that mantle and expanded upon it. So he took these little puffy Baroque instruments that had really high arching, you know, and they were beautiful, but they weren't very powerful. And he decided he'd make, first of all, bigger instruments with a much flatter arching. I'm a little bit into the weeds with the engineering here, so forgive me. But what that did was it completely changed the sonic nature of uh, a violin. And he made a few cellos, not very many. I think there's maybe six that survive now. Two are fully intact that I know. Uh, some of them have had pieces of them replaced. These are the cellos I'm talking about. Uh, two or three violas, Ara? Do you, yeah, something like that. I, some, a lot of them just didn't, he didn't make a lot of them and a lot of them didn't survive. Bunch of guitars, um, made guitars. In fact, he made one violin that looked, it was shaped like a guitar. It didn't have corners on it. Joshua Bell played on it for 15 years or so. And I saw a, a picture of a harp a couple of weeks ago that, that Stradivari made. But his focus was on violins. So uh, just back to the story, um, you know, we, we kept in touch and gave him information and uh, became quite good friends, actually. And one day, one of the owners said, well, we've been thinking about this a lot and you've had these things before and um, there's a connection with the city, which I won't go into, but the family kind of had a, a lot of deep connections to the city of Milwaukee, which is why it wound up back there. And she said, I remember this phone call, uh, she said, um, you know, you've had these, you know how to take care of them, you need somebody to look after it, um, we're not gonna put it in a vault, we're not gonna keep it in our house. What, what if you looked after it? What if, what if you played it? What a nice idea. And I said, um, yeah, that, that sounds really, <laughs> like, really, you know, let's, we're going to make that happen. A um, couple days later, I uh, drove home from Chicago with Lipinski Stradivari in my, the back seat of my car with its little seat belt. <laughs> praying that nobody would hit my car. And uh, so that's, that's how I personally wound up with it. Uh, I got this idea shortly after getting it when I found out really what the pedigree and history of this thing was. Um, we started, I mean, another couple other people started this project called uh, A Violin's Life. And because this instrument was associated with so many famous violinists and so many famous composers over the years, um, we, I thought, what if somebody just made a couple of recordings that, were, that had music on it that was directly associated with this particular instrument? And so we did, we did a Kickstarter campaign. I had no idea if anybody was going to be interested in this. And this is the early days of Kickstarter, maybe 10, 11 years ago. And, you know, over a period of 
60 days, somebody, people threw like $35,000 at us, which was more than enough to make a CD. Uh, you remember what CDs are, <laughs> right? And to do a really comprehensive website. And so there was a lot of research that went into it. The other interesting thing about this particular instrument is that there is a fair amount of um, information about it where it was, there are a couple of gaps of decades here and there that we weren't able to really fill in. But for the most part, we were able to put together this journey which started with the legendary sort of godfather of virtuoso violin playing, uh, Giuseppe Tartini. So for anybody who doesn't know who Tartini was, I, I don't know why this instrument is not called the Tartini Strad. <laughs> uh, he was the first sort of person to uh, uh, really get the violin out there in a virtuoso sense wrote hundreds and hundreds of compositions, uh, eventually became a noted pedagogue, um, uh, became really famous for writing treatises later in his life. Uh, he, was, he was really the guy that started the whole, the whole virtuoso violin thing. And from there, it went to a bunch of different, I mean, the, uh, the, the whole concept of the virtuoso was just coming into play. And then you had people like Paganini and Liszt and Chopin, eventually uh, Lipinski, Carol Lipinski. Nobody knows who Carol Lipinski is now. But in his day, in the 19th century, he was really a household name in the known European world. Very, very famous violinist. Um, Paganini was once asked who he thought the greatest violinist in the world was. Lipinski was a contemporary of Paganini. And Paganini replied, uh, well, I don't know, but I know who the second is. <laughs> <laughs> They're always a little bit like this, you know? <laughs> But this was also an era of almost like a carnival-like atmosphere where they'd hire these giant halls and have these huge concerts with virtuosos playing all of their own compositions. And there were even two occasions that I know of where Lipinski and Paganini appeared on the same concert and they'd play one right after another and then the audience would vote on who they thought the superior violinist was. Kind of it's like, like American Idol. Yeah, them. it's like a, like a violin smackdown. Yeah. You know? um, so this was the atmosphere that uh, Lipinski was working in. He had inherited or was given the violin by a student of Tartini's and uh, became a famous concertmaster, soloist, pedagogue, and had it for quite a while, probably 40, 40 years or so. Um, I don't know, where should we go now? So you can go on and on and on. Lipinski was very, very close with um, the Schumanns, for example. Uh, those of you who know Robert Schumann and his wife Clara, they were extremely tight and played chamber music all the time. It's fun every time I play a piece of any either Schumann's, um, I know that Lipinski had played it with them on this violin. And that's just one example. Well, and you and I just recently recorded the Grieg C minor. Uh, yeah, he was very, very close with Grieg. Um, a family that owned the violin later on was best friends with Grieg. Um, there's histories with Brahms. The, the, the person that owned the violin after Lipinski was named Julius Röntgen. Not the X-ray family, uh, although I've been told that there is a distant cousin somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in there, if anybody wants to X-ray a violin. Um, and the Röntgen family was this sort of dynasty. Julius became the concertmaster of the Gewandhaus Orchestra 
after Mendelssohn had founded it and left as conductor. And in the research that we were doing for this website, um, I was actually in touch with the Gewandhaus to just do the math. And he was concertmaster there for, I don't know, decades. And which meant that he played this violin in some pretty important performances, such as the premiere of the Brahms Violin Concerto. He was the concertmaster playing this violin for that concert, and Joseph Joachim was over there playing his 1715 Strad. Um, it's just mind-boggling to me uh, to, to, to think about that, and quite intimidating in, in a way. Um, it's almost like the, the instrument carries um, its own genetic code. That's yeah. History, right? It's an own genome throughout yeah. time and history. Yeah, I remember taking it home and thinking, you know, we sort of stared at each other. <laughs> and you, you know, it can go crazy. It's like Tartini, Röntgen. Uh, I know Joseph Joachim played on it for a little while. Um, anybody who was anybody, this sort of passed through their hands. And it's sitting in my studio. And I remember playing it, and I was like, it, it, you'll drive yourself crazy. You know, it, it, I just couldn't think about it. Every day, it sounded better. Um, this, the other strange things about these instruments is that they, they do become, we spend so much time with our instruments as professional musicians that it's a cliche, but it does sort of become an extension of you and your personality. And it's this mysterious thing where, I've had this happen with other you know, lesser well-known instruments, but over a period of months, you, I mean, for, it depends on you know, your personality and how, you, do you, how, how quickly uh, you can get used to an instrument, but you, it, it's kind of like this weird marriage, you know, or like a dating period. Hmm. where, you know, you're sort of trying to do your best to get what you can out of this, what is essentially a high-end tool. You know, it's, a, it's something that you make out of it. But at the same time, after about two or three months, this instrument sounded completely differently. And it was almost like it was sort of adapting to how I played. And um, so you're trying to put your best foot forward and hopefully getting something in return. Uh, it is a myth that if I gave this instrument to someone to play for a week, that they're automatically going to sound good. <laughs> if you give a bad violinist a Stradivari or a Guarneri del Gesù or an Amati, uh, most of the time, for a couple weeks, they're just going to sound like a bad violinist with a Stradivarius, you know. Um, you need time with it, and ironically, you actually work less. You have to learn to uh, kind of back off, especially with Stradivarius. They're famous with that. If you put, it, it's like, you know, you're used to driving a, a Ford Focus, nothing against Ford. Um, and then somebody gives you a Maserati. So it's really easy to crash a Maserati <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing. So I spent you know, two or three months just figuring out like, how much less I could work and get more out of the instrument. Whereas with lesser instruments, a lot of the time you're pushing, you're pushing, you're trying to get the sound out, you're working hard, because they're more difficult to play. Stradivarius are not difficult to play once you learn how, well, of course they're difficult to play. Any violinist will tell you, you know, um, I'll, I'll loan it to you, you can see what you can do with it, okay? Um, they have a temperament and you need to use, to learn how to use them. They will give back to you what you, what you put in, I think. It's interesting you say, you, know, you talked about Stradivarius as, you know, maybe the 
greatest instrument, instrument maker of history, regardless of instrument. It makes me think of an experience I had with um, the Fazioli piano brand. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to play in northern Italy in Sacile, which is where the Fazioli's are made. Fazioli is an Italian brand of piano, um, fairly recent brand in the last 30 years or so. And I met with Mr. Fazioli, and the first thing he talked about was Stradivarian. Really? Mm -hmm. wow. And how he was inspired by his example, the never resting on the laurels, and he proceeded to, of course, criticize all the major piano brands like Steinway and Rosendorf and everyone else for resting on their laurels and not changing a single design patent since 1910. He said that's the sign of death, that you know, uh, an instrument maker needs to constantly be reinventing the instrument. And so, you know, you were talking about working less in a way for an instrument that's, that I had the same experience where the first time I performed a concert on one of these instruments in Sachile, I was completely overplaying the instrument because I was so used to my workhorse Steinway at home. And Mr. Fazioli was in the room. He just said, chill. Yeah. Just, just let the instrument do it for you. And it, it, I know exactly what you mean. So I think this example maybe has inspired many yeah. genius people. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I've had plenty of days where the thing was clearly fighting me. And um, it didn't really, there, there are also instruments, especially Stradivarius and high-end Stradivarius, I mean, in the sort of middle golden period, but all of them really, they're unbelievably temperamental. And by that, I mean, um, one little thing is off, like the sound post isn't quite in the right place. Or the, you can move, with this partic particular instrument, you could, you could move the bridge like, less than a millimeter, and it'll change so many things. It's the response on the instrument, um, the kinds of strings you're using. Climate is a huge thing. Uh, you go in and out of air conditioning. They're, they're acoustic instruments. You know, the wood expands, the wood contracts. And uh, that, that's a fight sometimes. You know, you come to a place that's you know a little more humid than where I was a couple days ago, and it takes a day or so to figure that out. It's like why isn't why isn't this working the way it did when I was practicing? <laughs> and it, a lot of it has to do with atmosphere and and like not having that one little spark plug working in your Ferrari, you know. Um, so that's that's another thing you have to deal with. So Frank, you've, you've given us a really nice uh, framework for the instrument's history. Let's fast forward a little bit to your own history and history, what would that, what would that the, be? The history you have now imprinted <laughs> upon this violin's uh, story. Line. Yeah. So can we transition to the Milwaukee Symphony and sure. a fair summer's evening, no, winter's evening? <laughs> Actually, it wasn't, it wasn't a Milwaukee Symphony uh, concert. Um, uh, maybe some of you know that this violin in 2014 was uh, very famously stolen. Um, I have a concert series which was mentioned earlier and uh, just the, the short version is that we had played a fairly substantial concert that night. It was a piano, clarinet, cello, um, and violin. And uh, I remember it was an evening of Britain, Benjamin Britten and Olivier Messiaen, and, which doesn't sound like a blockbuster, but we had a really devoted audience, and there were you know, 300 people there. And um, we ended with the quartet for the end of time, which I don't know if any of you know that piece, but it's extremely deep, uh, intellectual in a certain way, very, very spiritual. It was written by a composer who was a prisoner of war in World War II and wrote it for members of the camp, the musicians that he could find in the camp, and that was the instrument 
instrumentation that he could put together. So it's, a, it's almost an hour long, and um, I'm always amazed when, it's, when we do a performance of it, how you could hear a pin drop almost through the whole thing, even though it, it would be considered a modernist work. So it was a big concert. We, there was a reception at the venue afterwards, and we sort of stumbled out of the stage door. And uh, I had one friend that was with me. We all sort of scattered and you know, went to our cars. And um, my car, I, I was really happy because I'd gotten a parking space really close to the stage door because it was about nine below zero <laughs> outside. And so I could just sort of run to the car. And uh, my friend walked across, he was maybe, you know, 50, 60 yards away, and I walked to my car, and I noticed directly next to my car was a van that had been backed in that wasn't there before the concert, but I thought there was a reception, you know, maybe somebody's picking up, there's somebody working at the reception, whatever. Um, van was running, and there were two people inside of it, and uh, I went to put the violin in the back seat in, a, in its little seat belt. And um, I noticed somebody get out of the driver's side and go around the back of the van so that they were eventually facing me as I was trying to get this thing in my back seat because my, par my car was parked straight in. Something I learned not to do anymore. <laughs> um, and it was cold. He had a big, one of those big sort of fur, like lined jackets and a big sort of fur helmet thing. And it was dark and I couldn't really see what was going on. And he was getting closer and closer, um, uncomfortably close. And sometimes people want to just come and talk to you and that's great, you know. But it's nine degrees outside. I want to get in the car, you know, it's like, and he, very slowly opened his jacket and uh, I saw these little flashing red lights and I thought, why is this guy taking my picture? And right at that moment, I remember, the violin was still over my shoulder, I hadn't gotten it into the car. Right at that moment, I remember feeling this like unbelievable pain and paralysis and I, al I almost instantly realized what had happened. The guy had shot me with a taser. So, um, yeah, it's not pleasant. You're right. It's, yeah. Um, so I went down. They're very effective weapons, by the way, you know. Um, if you ever had to get anybody difficult in the festival, you know. I'll yeah, keep uh, yeah. Uh, I know I'm at the point I'm making taser jokes, sorry. Um, so I went, you know, it's, it's designed to break up fights without using lethal force. This person, shall we say, uh, was not experienced with the taser. Um, I don't think he was really very experienced in anything except planning how to steal a Stradivarius. So I went down, he grabbed the violin, and I was apparently, I mean, I was out for like, you know, maybe 15, 20 seconds, but apparently I got up very quickly and immediately knew what happened because the van was gone and I remember seeing the van drive around the corner and I knew the violin was in the van. So I was hysterical and running in circles, I remember, and screaming because my friend hadn't gotten in, into his car yet and he was still like 100 yards away. And he had actually been sort of standing there and watched the van drive directly in front of him. By the way, this, this was not um, a quality vehicle. Okay, <laughs> this is like Scooby-Doo level <laughs> van, which also was weird to me, you know. Um, I was like, you know, what? Anyway, it, it, everybody was super confused 
especially me. And my friend ran over. Uh, we're very close. And he's, he's like, and I was like, they got the violin. And, and, you know, I mean, I was probably screaming at that time um, and out of my mind. And he said, wait a minute, the, those guys got your violin? Uh, the van that just went by? And I said, yeah. And somehow we figured out how to call 911. And we're in a parking lot. You can imagine. We're in a parking lot, and it's nine degrees. And uh, we, we went back to my friend's car so we wouldn't freeze to death. At that point, I noticed I had um, two taser barbs stuck in me. One was here. Um, one was in my wrist, because apparently at the last second, I kind of like defensively put up my hand, but it went into my wrist. So I'm sitting there with these, I don't know if you've ever seen a taser bar, but it's, they're like little fish hooks, you know, it comes out like that. And, well, I couldn't feel anything, you know, I was like, eh. um, so we call 911, and we're sitting in the car, and I'm explaining to a 911 lady who is very nice, Yes, it's a multi-million dollar instrument, and I just got shot with a taser, and could you please send somebody, like, now? <laughs> and, of course, she's like, uh, it, it's a what? Yeah. It, it, it's, it. anyway, we sat there for five minutes, and in these situations, it's not like it hadn't occurred to me that this, something like this might happen. But time is a factor, especially if it's somebody that knows what they're doing or thinks they know what they're doing. The more time that goes by, initially especially, um, the, the more dicey it gets. So we waited for five minutes. Nobody showed up and called him back and said, please, can you just send out you know, a squad car, something? Just get out here. And so this, um, I do, you know, I laugh about it now just because there's this Cone Brothers element to this whole thing. Um, this beat cop, you know, the very earnest squad car, really nice guys inside um, pulled up and asked me to get in the back seat uh, so they could, uh, you know, do their initial report and time's going by, and so tell me what happened. You know, that kind of thing. And I was like, guys, um, and I'm sitting on one of those plastic benches in the back of a, you know, you've been in the back of a squad car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, um, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm sitting there and answering these very mundane, it's worth how much? What, why, why are we out here with that? <laughs> so we play, we play, I have a series here. Um, it's, yeah, um, guys, can, maybe you could get on the radio and get some other people out here because, um, you know, time's like going. And they were like, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll get right on that. And, <laughs> And the, the craze, one of the craziest things about this is that the chief of the police at the time, Ed Flynn, um, was a symphony patron. He was actually on the board for a while, and I knew him. We'd been out for drinks. He loved, he grew up in Boston, went to the Boston Symphony as a kid. He loved music, loved symphonic music. And he knew the whole violin story from the time it dropped out of the sky until that night. So uh, I believe that either one of our development people or somebody, there was a federal judge involved, <laughs> remember that. They woke him at like 12.30 and uh, got the chief on the phone. And this is after I had had a very comical uh, exchange with the guys in the, in the squad car saying, listen, I know this sounds crazy, but do you think you could get the chief of police on the radio or using my cell phone that I have right here 
his number is in it, you know. <laughs> we sat there and sat there and sat there. And then all of a sudden, a they decided they'd get a detective there who then said, so tell me what happened. <laughs> and I was like, ah. Anyway, somebody at some point handed me a cell phone and he said, uh, Frank, this is Ed Flynn. And um, I know what's going on, I hope you're okay. And um, I want you to stay there for a little while, we're gonna send some people out there. And I understand the gravity of this and um, you, got, you can count on us, okay? And I was like, right. <laughs> you know? uh, I mean, I had no idea, you know. They, they, and then it was crazy because within about 15 minutes, there were probably five squad cars there, forensics team, an ambulance that I didn't want. We were across the street from a hospital. You know, I mean, lights, it was like the whole, it was like a TV show, you know? And um, the upshot is that it turned out that uh, the forensics guys figured out that when you fire a taser, it shoots out this little bit of chaff, you know, these little pieces of um, paper. And my personal taser uh, had been bought the summer before by the sublimely named Universal Knowledge, Allah. That's, he, a, name. that's a name. That was his legal name. And they traced it back to this guy with this little piece of chaff. And these guys are out there like. So they got in touch with the taser company, who initially very much resisted until the FBI gave him a little visit. And they gave us all the information. And so this guy that had bought the taser had bought it for the mastermind of this crime. Uh, who was planning it, apparently, for three or four years. I found out a lot of this six, seven months later. He knew where I lived. He knew my two daughters' names. He knew my car. He knew where they went to school. He wasn't dumb. He just knew how to steal a violin, but he wasn't quite sure what to do with it. So, <laughs> I know, it's like, well, now what? Um, <laughs> we have this, you know, I just don't think these two guys had any idea the ton of bricks that was coming down. We, we held out hope, I think, until about six o'clock in the morning that maybe, you know, there had been some misunderstanding <laughs> or it, we could somehow get the thing back. And that was nonsense because they, it turned out they drove north of where we were playing, which was the wrong way if you were going to O'Hare to get out of the country. Uh, and they had dumped the case. So they had, un they had in the van taken the violin out of the case and the bows, <laughs> and they found the case the next morning. Uh, the police found it, um, and it was sitting by the side of the road in the snow, and it was empty, except for the iPad that was in the music compartment. They didn't take that. They, they took, they probably because they thought it would track them or something, but they took the violin and the bows were gone, and when the bows were gone, I knew these were probably people that knew something about art theft because bows are very, very valuable. And it kind of snowballed from there. Um, there was this crazy period for about, I'd say six days, where every day I went to the police station, um, I took a polygraph, got fingerprinted. Everybody with, that was performing that night, they, they tracked them down and they had to sort of exclude all of us because clearly it was an inside job. <laughs> yeah. Um, insurance companies going crazy. Um, somebody, we had a couple people working on a reward for it. 
Ed Flynn put, I believe, 14 or 15 homicide detectives on this case, which didn't really make everybody happy. Yeah. You but know? at least Milwaukee's a very safe city. Yeah, it's very safe, yeah. Um, these guys, you know, they, first of all, they were fascinated with the case. Secondly, they were happy that nobody was dead. And they really plunged into it. And I, I found out later these guys were, were you know, doing 12-hour shifts. And they were trying everything. Finally, somebody shot off their mouth, uh, as often happens. And it turns out it was the aforementioned universal knowledge Allah, who owned a barber shop like a legitimate business. He had two daughters. He was in his late 30s. These were not kids. Um, he's sitting in his barbershop. Oh, also he, he sold Tupperware on the side. <laughs> true. A abso absolutely true. He sold Tupperware to make money. Um, yeah, I mean, I could, I mean, one time he told me that, I was like, Tupperware? It's like, Right, exactly, yeah, it may be, yeah, they don't make Tupperware that big. But uh, he was in his barbershop cutting somebody's hair, and he was watching CNN, and he said to some friend of his, you know, I think I, know, I might know something about that case. He was cutting this guy's hair, and the guy was like, really? He said, yeah. Um, he said, uh, what time do you finish tonight? And it was seven, whatever. So let me give you a ride home. So he came right home. The guy talked a little bit about the case and that a taser was used. And it turns out the guy was an informant. The guy whose hair he was cutting was an informant and immediately got in touch with the police. And the next day, they arrested him. And I actually think he was sort of duped into this whole thing because he wasn't the main guy. But he had a lot to say. And so did the guy who planned the whole thing. Um, he had a habit of talking a lot. I mean, really, a lot. To things like news organizations. <laughs> he blew through, I think, three or four attorneys who just kept telling him to shut up. Don't do interviews. And he, and he fancied himself this, like, you know, mastermind uh, repelling down and stealing paintings. And he would have been better off, you know, stealing my wallet, really. And eventually, they arrested him and told blah, blah, blah. Nine days later, they came to a plea bargain. And he said, I'll take you to where the violin is. The deal was the violin had to be in good shape no damage, and uh, they reduced his sentence remarkably because it was his third felony. Which even in the state of Wisconsin, if you have three felonies, you can't buy a taser. <laughs> which, is, which is why he had his friend buy the taser. So one night, a bunch of SUVs apparently went out and he drove them all over the city like for about an hour and a half. To couldn't quite remember where he, he had put it. And so they wound up at this dilapidated house on the south side of Milwaukee. And the door was unlocked. And there was no, there was no one there. Um, it was about 30 degrees in the house. And, uh, you know, he was kind of talking to everybody and enjoying the limelight. And, uh, Eventually, they said, where's the violin? And, he, and he, he went like this. So there's all these giant cops and SWAT guys, you know. And there was one guy from the FBI arts crimes, art crimes team who was slightly smaller stature, tough guy. I wouldn't mess with him. He was the only person that would fit in the attic. And they said, so they, they borrowed a ladder from the SWAT team, which also cracked me up. They didn't have a ladder. Uh, I, I'm like, OK. So get up there. And he's looking around. He didn't see anything. And then he saw over in the corner um, a blue vinyl suitcase. 
And he opened it up, and there was the violin. And the bows. And it was wrapped in a baby blanket. And also in the suitcase was the driver's license of the person that had stolen it. <laughs> right. These are uh, uh, yeah. really brilliant yeah. folks. Yeah. yeah. There was one article that I think nailed it when they said it was like Abbott and Costello meets Cheech and Chong. <laughs> So I had, in the meantime, gone down to Florida to play some concerts. I got this a couple of phone calls that sounded crazy to me. Are you sure it's the right violin? Uh, I'm talking to Ed Flynn. He said, well, it, you know, it looks like the right violin to me. <laughs> I flew back the next day, immediately drove to where the owners were with the violin. And it was just like the three or four of us. And there it was. And I think there was some, you know, hugs and a few pictures and some tears. And I played a little bit and put it back in its case and put it in my car and drove home. <laughs> and then we stared at each other again. And, uh, you know, it was this, such a surreal experience and it, it, it made me finally think that, you know, now, no matter what I want, it, it, it's, it, you, you think you're playing these things and you've got them and they're yours. But that thing was 300 years old at the time and it's, it's still going to be around long after I am. And, you know, in the end, you, you're, you're kind of going through its life. It's not really the other way around. But that was sort of a revelation to me because like it or not, we're part of this history now and whoever gets it next hopefully won't have to go through that. But um, yeah, so that's uh, almost the end of the story. <laughs> it is for now. So, yeah. so how many days all together was it gone? Nine. Nine excruciating days, except I was in Florida for two days, but it, 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 it wasn't that great. Yeah. So how do you go around with the now? Sorry? You have an armed force that's following you. Yeah. You know, she, I don't know if you heard the question, but she asked, it, you know, about security measures now and things like that. And obviously there's some things that happen that I can't talk about, but you know, the problem with walking around with security guys is that all you do is draw more attention to it. It's like, well, why, is he, why are those cops following him? Um, or why is there a security guard off stage? And I admit that for about a year, year and a half, there were people around a lot, very quietly. There was a cop car parked in front of my house for about two months. I was taught evasive driving things, um, various other things. Mostly I just try not to do something stupid with it, like leave it on the top of your car, you know, or, or in a taxi cab, or in a, or in a taxi cab like Yo-Yo did, you know. I mean, that, the, this, one of the strangest things about this case is that to this day, according to the FBI and Interpol, it's still the only high-end, like Stradivari, Guarneri level violin that was deliberately targeted and stolen. They're always stolen accidentally, always, which gave me some comfort. Somebody leaves it in a cafe, they leave it on a train. And this has happened with quite well-known people. They leave it in a taxi, you know. So to me, I go through the TSA and I just don't say anything. And it's, it's been much safer that way. There, there's some, there's been a couple scary moments, not really anything, but um, I mean, honestly, it would be like the dumbest thing to steal now. So just all of you remember that. <laughs> yeah, they, you, would, you wouldn't get very far. Yeah. Yes? So what's the name of the book or the movie? <laughs> right, there actually, was, there actually was a movie that came out um, that was a semi-documentary uh, that actually made it to Trebekah. And it premiered at Trebekah. 
It was beautifully shot. The, the one thing I really regret is that the two, there were a couple of kids making it. Yeah. And they turned it into a story much more about the two people that, that stole it <laughs> rather than the fact that it was an armed robbery. So it became a sort of social justice thing, which was something that was always on my mind every day. It's like, you know, rich symphony patrons, they have the Stradivarius, it's a bunch of rich white people in a city that's already balkanized. And none of that ever came into this story at all, ever. In fact, there were people on the north side where these guys lived, who they were really upset. And some of them came to some of the hearings and they would pull me aside. They're like, we're just really sorry. This is not our community. The last thing they want is a bunch of FBI guys and cops coming into their neighborhood, right? Yeah. So that was the disappointment with that film, along with the fact that the director was a little bit loopy and didn't really know what to do with it, um, just how to tell the story. But I'll tell you, at least once a month, there's some inquiry about possibly doing something. Actually, something happened yesterday, even. Ah. Hey, let's make a docu-series, you know, and um, that's not. Some... a big budget. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, I, well, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> maybe the Coen brothers. Yeah, maybe the Coen brothers, yeah, 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 so. Yes. Are you a dealer? <laughs> can you can you ask your question again for people? That... About how many strats are there around in the world? Uh, and is this the only one with the Milwaukee? It's not the only one that has a history with Milwaukee. I played another one um, called the Dushkin, which was named after the person who Stravinsky did most of his violin works with. Um, I, I was jo half joking, but it really does depend on which dealer you talk to. Because some of them are composites by now. They've been damaged and then fixed. Um, it's a mystery. Yeah, it's a you know, ballparky, maybe four or 500 are left. That's my opinion which is really saying something. And it says how well they were taken care of because they were really, really prized. And all through the hundreds of years, people took care of them. I mean, they tr really treasured them. And this is, this is like a story. Are there any in the Chicago? Yeah, there's some around, yeah. I don't think in the violin section. I think the Chicago Symphony owns a couple of instruments. I know uh, Robert Chan, the, the um, concert master, he plays the Strat. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I mean, they, this story is like, I mean, they've washed up on beaches. They've been, there was one that was on top of a car in LA that somebody drove off and they found it by the freeway. There's Josh Bell's violin now that was famously stolen in the 30s twice. Yeah, the Uberman instrument. Um, so. What about that part that it's it lying under the bed for 20 years? Yeah. Well, that was the the uncle of the person that brought it back to Milwaukee. It's a long story. You can go to the website, which is called aviolinslife.org. So. Uh, it's got all of, all of that on there. He bought it for his wife, who was quite a, a gifted violinist, and they, he was a pianist. They met at the Nuremberg Trials. You know, it's just endless. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Yes? I want to know how many did he make, Stradivari, and did he play? Didn't play much, as far as everybody knows, and nobody really knows how many he made. That's part of the problem. I mean, you know, some people think he made seven, eight hundred over a period of, you know, that, that's actually pretty good for yeah. a 20, 30 year period with a bunch of guys working for him. So, 
Yes. When you mentioned the uh, Bratislav Vermont violin, that's another fascinating story. Yeah. And the fellow that stole that at Carnegie Hall, because Huberman was playing on another violin at the time, kept it for 40, 50 years. He was a second-rate violinist, and he was playing it, and on his deathbed, he admitted to his wife that this is Huberman's strand. He played it in a cafe in, the, in midtown Manhattan for years and years. Amazing. Yeah. But he confessed on his death by the And I actually recommend a movie to everyone here if you're interested in that particular story. It's a movie called The Inextinguishable Symphony. And it's about Bronislav Huberman yeah. founding the Israel Philharmonic. But it also peripherally deals with this, the theft of that violin as well. Let's see. There was a question right in the middle. Yeah. Did the thieves have plans to sell the violin or what did they want to do with it? This is one of the great mysteries of this, because nobody knows what they were going to do with it. All, I can, all anybody could speculate was that they were going to hang on to it for a while, maybe get some insurance money, but he couldn't do anything with it. Literally, 14 hours later, the entire world was looking for this violin and looking for this guy. And he couldn't play it. Couldn't show it to anybody. All he could do was hide it. He couldn't sell it. I mean, you know, um, I, I honestly, I don't know. And the insurance company was not going to pay out money. Uh, they they had a kind of blanket policy. They weren't going to. They didn't want to pay it to just thieves. Question. Yes. Is there any way of calculating its current intrinsic value? I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> yes, yes, there is. The market for Strads runs anywhere from, I'd say the low end, the very low end right now is probably four or five million dollars. Now somebody paid, about a month ago, somebody paid 15 million bucks for Tasha Seidel's old Strad, which was rumored to have played, been played in The Wizard of Oz. Now, this is a fantastic instrument, and it's in really good condition. At what, at what point does it become overvalued? That's a good question, isn't it? How do you evaluate them? There's a finite number of them. He's not making them anymore. They're singular. They're, they really are the best and superior in my opinion, to almost any instrument I've ever, ever played. There are spectacular modern instrument makers. And for a lay person to hear one behind the other, that's the only way you would really know, unless you were a player. Because modern instruments are harder to play. They're harder to project sometimes. Strads aren't. You play the same thing on one instrument, you'd know right away. The other thing is they're, they're completely unique. They're these functional antiquities. I can look at this painting, anybody in here can, and it's gonna mean something different to everybody. But it's a painting, and it sits on the wall, right? It's not making noise, it's not doing anything, it's, it's in your head. I could get a table from Ikea that's going to hold my coffee up just fine. Or I could get a Biedermeyer table, which will do exactly the same thing, but it's a Biedermeyer table. So they're, they're just totally unique, and there's not one thing about them, not one particular thing. It's like a thousand things that, that, that go into the... So, yes, sorry. Uh, yes. What are the plans for the Lipnitsky violin uh, after you? Where's it going next? Just don't, just don't ask the owners. <laughs> I don't know. I, honestly, it's a, it's a long-term loan. Does it belong to you or you, it still belongs to the people? It still belongs to the people, yeah. I just didn't have that kind of cash laying around. <laughs> I'm a musician, all right? But you, you and I can talk later if, you're, you know, if you have a hedge fund or something. <laughs> 
But, but, but just, just to comment on the, on the picture a little bit, I mean, you know, if that painting were by Rembrandt, it would be worth, you know, X million. Right. If someone then decides that it's by Rembrandt's brother-in-law, it's suddenly worth nothing. Yeah, or if it's a fake Rembrandt. Pro the provenance and a famous name attached to something seems to attract an enormous amount of... It does. Stradivari definitely, yeah, it's the gold standard and his name, as soon as it's on, even the worst Stradivaris, and there are a couple that just don't sound that good. They're okay, but they don't sound that good, but it says Stradivari on it, so it's gonna be a couple million. How come somebody hasn't figured out how to duplicate? I don't know. Do you have any ideas? <laughs> Right, they've studied all, all, everything about it down to the molecules in the varnish. This is what I mean by, it's not one thing, it's not four things, it's a thousand different things. It's the wood, it's the varnish, it's the way it was engineered, it's maybe the age. I, I, I don't know, I wish I knew. There was a documentary on PBS about this that they were trying to recreate. Yes, with Joseph Najaveri from, there's a guy at Texas A&M who has been doing this for 30 years, yeah. I'm sorry, where are we? Hi. We know the, the violin is worth a lot of money. Can we talk to, about the bows for yeah. a minute? And um, I'd like to ask two questions about the bows. I, I also know a violinist and how much her bows sold for in Chicago, and I was, I was astounded. Were these bows also old? Are they old and were they made by the same people? Or were there separate specialists that made them? Can you tell us a little bit about the bows? Well, here's mystery number 7,422. <laughs> so most of the really, really great bows were made in France in the 19th century. Why? I, I, I don't know. But the difference is that there are people making bows now that, in my opinion, are equal to them and for a fraction of the price. So, but bows can be, you know, fifty, seventy-five, hundred thousand dollars, $100,000. Or you can buy a modern one. I have one of each, and um, modern ones can still go for $15,000, $20,000. But, you know, I know really famous violinists who play on not great bows, and they love it. They're like pool cues, you know. <laughs> what, once you get used to it, you, you can do whatever you want, you know, and, and it, it, it's a $4,000 bow, you know, so. Yes, the problems of, um, what's the problems of the Stradivarius that are really difficult to around? That they're, they're lent to people. You mentioned something like that, and I thought, and you said young performers. How does somebody, how does one get to play with those? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, there's no application process. <laughs> um, I heard you could go to the post office. Yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of people buy them as investments, especially now. And a lot of people that can't play buy them as investments. Then they use it as a tax dodge because they can loan it to somebody and write off a whole bunch of it. So, ah, yeah. Do you have one? No, no okay. Uh, so they identify people and they yeah. can say, I'm going to do my violence. Right. And then you're basically, you know, the curator for this thing. Often you'll pay the insurance, which can be, you know, substantial. And then is there a registry in Cremona? Like, they know where all the ones are? I don't think, is there an, uh, there's no official registry because there's some where they're private collectors and they don't want them. There are some famous collections that people know about. Um, there are violins floating around. Most of the sort of golden period strads, people know what they're doing. Um, I mean, where, where they are and who's playing them. There's a couple. There's a couple in museums. The museum in Cremona. Yeah, yeah. And the Smithsonian has a couple of them. But there's a downside to that too, because they sit there. Yes. Yes. The one in the one in Cremona gets played something like every week. Yeah. They take. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. He yeah. goes out and plays a couple scales. I know, I know of a violin in San Francisco. At the, it was at the Palace of the Legion of Honor. Mm -hmm. It was eventually given to Alex Boranchik, right. the concertmaster of the San Francisco City. This is Heifetz's old violin. Heifetz's it's Heifetz's old violin. Heifetz's yeah. violin. It just used to be sitting behind a glass case, didn't it? Yeah. You had a question right here. Uh, maybe this is for both of but could you or would you play your instrument for us? What is Please. <laughs> I thought you had it. <laughs> okay. Not much, okay? Because otherwise you're not going to come on Thursday. Now, he's under a special contract with us, but we can't play too much. Okay, so. You want to see it too? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's hard to play it without you seeing it. Okay, so there it is. Catch. <laughs> um, doesn't look like much. Doesn't weigh much. But the color is beautiful. Color is beautiful. The top has been um, sort of refurbished, shall we say. The Wurlitzers uh, were a high-end dealership in a dealership. It sounds like a car. <laughs> Um, in New York in the early, in the mid 60s, it was very common for them to sort of like redo the varnish on the top if, if it were too light. We could strip it off of here, but it, it wouldn't look great. The back is much more beautiful. Probably the whole instrument at one point was that color, that red, that really reddish brown color. Um, Can you hold it a little higher so folks can back? What were the repairs that What were the what? Oh, the repairs, it, you know, it was simple stuff. A, a seams were open, um, the fingerboard needed to be raised, it, it small stuff. Um, nothing major, a couple, couple cracks that you can fix very easily. So. Okay, thank you. Very much. <laughs> okay. Um, oops. This did not come with it. You should probably turn off the ladder. Yeah, I don't know. Do I need to turn something off? Huh? You sure? All right. One of the things about Stradivarius is that um, for an acoustic instrument, especially in a room like this, they're pretty loud. And especially under your ear, they're really loud. Um, but they're incredibly even also. Um, let me just tune for spots on it, you know? I mean, it's just this really, really full sound that goes from here, where there aren't any dead notes, you know? You don't really have to work to have it speak to the back of the room. And you can go from here. You know, that'll go to the back of Carnegie Hall without a whole lot of effort. I mean, I'm not really pressing very much. There's also this kind of, um, you know, there's a real kaleidoscope of colors on this thing.
if you learn to sort of turn these corners, there's no, we don't have pedals. We don't have, no offense. Um, yeah, well, he's got to deal with, you know, touch and um, having a different instrument wherever he goes. Um, we have to deal with intonation. <laughs> There's no keys, there's no frets. We spend half of our life trying to play an A major skill really in tune, and it's hard. Um, but I would say also the interesting thing about them is way up on the fingerboard, this black area here is called the fingerboard, um, it still stays very even, even if I'm playing quietly. Pretty high for the D string. If you figure the same note on the E string, sounds like this. Much brighter and much more focused. So, um, well, there, there's something. Um, come see the. <laughs> So how does one go about tracking the history of a single instrument? Where are the sources? What, 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 what do you think that? It, it, it took about a year and a half. Archives, um, books, just some logical things like, you know, calling the Gewandhaus or, or you know, being in touch with the Gewandhaus Orchestra to see this family that had an association not just with Mendelssohn, but all the conductors after that, while this concert master was playing it, he passed it down to his family. We put all of that together. Um, Julius Röntgen wound up being a very famous composer, uh, one of the founders of the Komserkeval. Um, and then from there, it was trickier in the 20th century, ironically, because um, there were just a couple of decades we weren't quite sure where, where it was. And then it sort of disappeared, you know. But um, there was a lot, of, a lot of legwork and a lot of research, just old-fashioned books, history, you know, that kind of thing. So. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lipinski Strad and Frank Hallman. Thank you for coming. <laughs>